Today we are talking about ultra processed food and how, can it, how it can affect your waistline and your health. All right, so I love this topic. There's been a lot about it in the news recently, ultra processed food, this, this term that you might have heard on, on the news or in headlines or on blogs, ultra processed food. So I want to unpack this topic today because there's a lot of misconceptions about these terms. So let's unpack it, let's keep it really simple for you and let's show you a way that you can really understand these different categories so that you can lean toward the best choices for you, both for dialing down your risk, lowering your risk of chronic disease and releasing unwanted pounds. So if you're new to my channel, uh, welcome. Welcome to my kitchen. Um, I'm Sophie and my passion is helping women, particularly over the age of 45, get into the best shape of their life inside and out reduce their risk of chronic disease and maintain it for the rest of their life as a lifestyle. If you want to know or learn, I should say, a little bit more about my overall philosophy, then there is a free masterclass underneath this video. So just click on the link and you can learn a little bit more about me and my approach and, and, and what I do. So let's get onto this topic of processed food, ultra processed food. So a lot of women come to me, I've been in this space for a long time, two decades. A lot of women come to me and they say, Sophie, I don't eat any processed food. And I'm like, wait a minute, I think you probably do. No disrespect, but I think you do. We all do. My kitchen, my fridge, my pantry, my freezer is full of processed foods. And so I want to explain the difference between an unprocessed food, a processed food, a minimally processed food and an ultra processed food because I've sort of boiled it down to four different categories. And if you understand what these four different categories are, it's really, really helpful for you as you go shopping, as you prepare food for yourself and your loved ones, you sort of know where you are as you're shopping um, for these different foods or, you know, sourcing these different foods. So four different categories. Number one, there is truly unprocessed food. Two, minimally processed food. Three, processed foods. Four, ultra processed foods. And I'm gonna make this really simple for you with a show and tell, okay? So, an ear of organic corn is a completely unprocessed food. I could have just gone into the field pick this, or if I grew, had a garden, I could just pick it, and nothing has, there is no processing involved whatsoever. I could just sink my teeth into it or steam it, completely unprocessed. I think we're all agreed. And so think of unprocessed foods as being whole fruits and vegetables, something that there has been literally no sort of intervention in it. Nothing has changed, nothing has been added and nothing has been taken away. And a processing facility or equipment was not involved in this food getting into your kitchen or on your table. So whole fruits, vegetables, you know, a fish plucked straight from the ocean, nothing's done to it, that would also be in the category of um, an unprocessed food. Now, let's talk about a minimally processed food. So we've got the corn, and then the corn is perhaps turned into a tortilla, a simple corn tortilla, okay? So this one might be minimally processed, meaning that there are very few ingredients in it. There, is corn, there are three ingredients on this particular ingredient label. A good way of thinking about it is that a minimally processed food and a processed food, which I'm gonna show you in a moment, you could, if push came to shove, put, make it. You could make it in your kitchen. So if I was, if I had the corn, the organic corn kernels, and if you've ever seen the Blue Zone documentary, Live to 100, it's really interesting because in Costa Rica, which is one of the areas um, that they highlight, one of the Blue Zones, 
um, they actually show you know the old way that they would get the corn kernels they would use they would stone grind them it took a lot of elbow grease you know mix it together with water and make corn tortillas and I was like that is so cool I wish I could do that but I don't do that um, but this you know is minimally processed there's very very few ingredients in it and so there you go minimally processed now going a bit more into the processed we would maybe go to a uh, corn chip okay so this particular corn chip and it just has you know two I think it has four ingredients in it so we are talking now uh, about added oil. You know, these are made of oil, a little bit, bit of added salt, a um, little bit of added, you know, lime juice, depending on the tortilla chip that you get. There are ones that I'll show you in a minute that are ultra processed. Um, in this category of processed foods, there is, there are many subcategories. And so it's a big spectrum because you could get a corn tortilla chip and some of them are loaded with sodium and oil and cheese powder and goodness knows what else. And so, you know, within that category, this is just a little side note, there is healthy and unhealthy within the category of processed. And that is where you have to get very, very good at knowing how to read a nutrition label, looking primarily at the daily value percentage for sodium and fat and also added sugars, okay? And then we go to ultra processed, right, which are these Doritos right here, and there is an extremely long ingredient list. And there are chemicals, there are flavor enhancers, it is, there's got to be about at least 50 ingredients in this packet. And so this is an ultra processed food. Now, obviously the, the, there's a lot of problems with ultra processed foods. They're completely pretty much devoid of nutrition. They've had everything that could be remotely nutritious stripped out of them. And then they've had everything added to them, which is really not good for your health. The other really pernicious thing about ultra processed foods is that the way that they are engineered by food scientists, by taste scientists to reach this specific sort of they call it a bliss point of all the different sort of salty and sour and sweet and everything and it's a whole science that goes into it makes them extremely addictive. And therein lies a massive problem with these ultra processed foods. You eat them, you cannot stop eating them, and yet you are not getting any nutrition whatsoever. So you are starving hungry afterwards. It really cannot honestly be classed as a food, anything that is ultra processed. And unfortunately, I think the latest statistics show that about 50% of Americans um, a, a very large proportion of their diet is ultra processed food. Now, the problem with ultra processed food is that it has been uh, associated with type two diabetes, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and certain cancers. There's been about 15 observational studies that have made this connection, this association between chronic disease and obesity, which is now classed as a disease, um, and ultra processed foods. So it is a real problem. And, and it is, it, it's, it's also sad because many of these ultra processed foods are a lot less expensive to buy than some of the healthier foods. And so, you know, our children and many are eating these foods. And for the first time ever, we're seeing children, young children with type two diabetes and even non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It is a massive problem and obviously the obesity. So just be careful when you start look, go looking for things because certain sort of snack foods and, and, and foods that you might be giving to children and babies or if you're a grandparent, they might fall into the ultra 
uh, process category, which is when you're looking at that label and you're seeing sort of more than five ingredients, then you really want to get your magnifying glass out or get your, in my case, get my glasses on, my readers on and have a really, really good look. One of the things that I want you to start doing, whether you're looking at a processed food or a ultra processed food, as I said before, is have a really good look at the sodium daily value and the fat daily value and added sugars because on most uh, ultra processed foods it is sky high you know one of the chronic diseases that i didn't mention i said cardiovascular disease but you know within that is stroke and you know this very very high sodium is leading to unprecedented rates of stroke in younger and younger people as well so um those are the four categories um, there's one other term that I just want to bring into, into this whole discussion, which is um, hyperpalatable foods. So I work with a lot of women who uh, really want to release weight. Now, one of the interesting things, or oh, a little side note, um, there has been a recent study, and I'm going to link to it in the description to this video, that the brilliant Kevin Hall, who did a lot of studies for The Biggest Loser, and he sets up these uh, studies in metabolic wards. They're very, very well-designed studies. And um, he did a study on ultra-processed foods, which is why it sort of hit the headlines recently. And one of the findings, which is pretty astonishing, is that those that ate the ultra-processed foods ate on average 500 more calories a day. That is significant. 500 more calories a day, a day. So if you, that goes on over time, you can see why it leads to obesity very, very quickly, these kinds of foods. Um, so this other term is foods that are hyperpalatable. So many of the women I work with, and I don't know if this is you, find that they say to me, Sophie, I'm a comfort eater. You know, I'm an emotional eater. I'm a stress eater. Well, I get it and I appreciate it. And, and we live in, in a society with so many food temptations, so many hyper palatable foods that it's at every turn. And these foods are a little bit like drugs, you know, they give us a dopamine hit. And this is where it gets a little bit more subtle and nuanced because I'm not, not necessarily saying you're going to go for a bag of Doritos for comfort food, but we tend to want to go for foods that are very high in oil, salt, oily salty, which would be those kind of chips and, and, and uh, anything that's oily and salty, nuts that are oily and salty, or you know, sugary and oily and fatty. It's that sort of mixture of oil, fat, salt and sugar that makes a food hyper palatable. And this can be in a high-end restaurant. This can be in a, a home delivery that you get of sort of relatively healthy food. It could be a whole food plant-based diet. It could be a vegan diet. It could be, those dietary patterns can be full of hyper palatable foods, foods that just make you want to eat more because they comfort you. And it, and, and it, um, it, it, it sort of interacts with your, well, it not sort of, it does interact with your brain chemistry, your satiety signals, you know, and, and, and it's so, it's a complex mechanism that goes on when we eat these hyper palatable foods. You know, even meat and, 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 and the way that all animal flesh can be prepared with, you know, salt and it's fatty and it's cooked, then that suddenly becomes something that's hyper palatable as well. So always think kind of oily, fatty, salty, sugary. Um, the difference would be between if you were to take something like a completely raw nut, let's just say a raw almond or a raw cashew, okay, that's not hyper palatable. But the minute that thing is roasted and it's got oil on it and it's got tons of salt on it and it's in a bag, then suddenly that's hyper palatable. And when it's hyper palatable, it's really hard for you to put the brakes on, to basically stop eating it. So hyper palatable foods can over time lead to, to weight gain. Now I speak to women who are mainly over the age of 50 and in menopause, and I'll finish with this. When we are younger, we can get away with some foods going lower down on the scale, you know, uh, sorry, higher up on the scale, we can get away with some, 
you know, ultra processed foods, you know, think of what you ate when you were a kid, right? We can get away with some, you know, pro more processed foods as we get older and our body changes and our estrogen drops. A lot of women come to me and they say, Sophie, but I'm eating healthy and they are to all intents and purposes, but in my experience to really, really move the needle and to really change, to reverse disease, that chronic disease that might have taken hold, like insulin um, insensitivity, hypertension. Remember, chronic disease presents long after it's already taken hold in your body. Okay, so many women that I'm working with, we are looking to reverse or lower risk of disease. And many women that I work with are looking to release a significant amount of weight. And much of this weight is in the belly region, also known as visceral fat. So when we get into this stage of life, what you could sort of get away with, as it were, when you were in your 20s and 30s, you can know even early 40s, is just not possible. You just can't anymore. And that's where making a significant switch and a significant move to as many completely unprocessed and minimally processed foods is really the direction that you want to go in. I'll give you one more quick example before I say goodbye for today. Let's take something as simple as an oat, right? A lot of you probably eat oatmeal. And so there is on the absolute minimally unprocessed, and this is, it's almost as, it's, it's as unprocessed as it can get, is something called an oat groat. And this is a whole intact grain. And you can buy them. They're actually called naked oats often. I love them. My clients love them. You buy them, you soak them overnight, they're chewy. And because it hasn't been broken down, it hasn't been processed in any facility or, or barely. So because of that, your body has to work very, very, very hard to break it down. So it's a very, very slow release of sugars, okay? Then, next up, we get to a steel cut oat. Okay, well, there's been a little bit of processing there, kind of minimally, but it is a processed food, a steel cut oat, right? Way, way better um, than uh, instant oats. We'll get to that in a moment. But you would have to probably soak that or cook it for 20 minutes or in a crock pot overnight. It takes a little bit more cooking to break it down, but that's a really good choice. Then we go to a rolled oat, okay, a little bit more processed now, okay, it is rolled out, still love rolled oats, still fine for most people, it can sp spike blood sugar in some with type 2 diabetes, but that is a person to person basis, it's different for everybody. And then we go to instant oats, which is where it's really been chopped up basically into tiny little pieces so that you can just throw some hot water on it and you've got your breakfast, but that spikes your blood sugar way more quickly. So that was another example for you. Hope you found this video useful today. Um, I wanted to unpack that a little bit for you. Uh, check out some of my other videos and I'll see you next time.